welcome guys it's pre-show it is pre-show it's pre-show i'm frankie this is kathy and we are from the school of ministry we are on staff at the school it's pre-show kathy day two i know are you sure it's day two I think it is. I I know. We're checking our calendars at this point. It has been so epic. I feel like so much has happened in two days. And I don't know about you. You have to let me know. I last night Becky blew me away. She was amazing. I just couldn't I couldn't believe how much there was there. I feel like I was just eating. I was at a feast and just eating up. So I mean I'm loving it. Are you enjoying it? I am enjoying it. And what I loved about Becky is when she gave her call to action. And did you, when, when she gave that, what did what did you feel? Did you feel like, oh, I want to jump right into that? I or? mean, honestly, I am I just feel so impacted. Still today, I woke up this morning just thinking like, where, where can I, where do I need to be more me? Where do I need to, um, yes, not listen to the outside noise. I just, I'm still... I'm still bouncing around in it. I think there was so much goodness in there. Absolutely love it. Now, you guys may notice, if you've been around for the last couple of days, that we at the School of Ministry are doing our own call to action. And our call to action is come to the School of Ministry or make a plan to come to the School of Ministry. Because sometimes it takes a little bit of planning to, to actually get here. And we've tried to sweeten the deal a little bit. I don't know if that's, you'd call that a bribe or an encouragement or just let's have some fun while we're, you know, meeting you and getting to know you. And yeah. that is the Nintendo, a Nintendo Switch. Switch. So I haven't met one person, France, who's like, eh. I don't think I would want a Nintendo. Everyone's oh, like, no. what? A Nintendo Switch? We have already so, had so many. You know, it's the prize and you yeah. can still win it, can't you? Honestly, this already, guys, we have got plenty of names in this raffle, but I would be heading over to our booth. We're going to give you more information on that. But here's the question. So I love a Switch. I have a Switch. I think it's so much fun. Uh, it's something that we love doing with our friends when they come over. It, we're laughing our heads off constantly with it. When it comes to the school, so where does this fit in? Where do game consoles fit in with us at the school? Okay, so it's a really good question because when we were, you know, we had this idea, what should we get? What would be really fun? What would everyone love? And so we decided to get the Switch. So when I bought the Switch, then I came home that night and as I was falling asleep, you know, sometimes when you when you fall asleep, as, <laughs> and, you know, these ideas start to float to your head. And I, I suddenly <laughs> thought, is a Switch a great idea? Does it go with the values of the school's yeah. ministry? And, and I, I thought, oh, I need to just stop for a minute and ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, is, is this the right thing for us to be giving away? And, you know, maybe that sounds really superficial, but I think it's actually really good to ask the yeah. Holy Spirit whatever you're unsure about. Yeah. And I immediately felt the Holy Spirit starting to speak to me and saying, at the School of Ministry, what we really value is that we learn to comfort the things that need to be comforted in us with God, yeah. with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. And instead of looking to games or, you know, sex or drugs or alcohol mm -hmm. or, or performance or yeah. whatever it is, trying to be perfect all the time, that we learn to lean into his presence. And so at the school, yeah. that's one of the things we're really going after is learning that we get all our comfort and our identity and our, our um, you know, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Yeah. It's Christ in me who is yeah. helps me be me and helps me achieve what I am designed to do. And so at the end of the day, I think, yes, we can play these games for fun, but we learn when to say yes to things and when to say no to things. And we learn to to manage ourselves and not disappear into a game system. So is this a great prize? Yes, I do believe it is. <laughs> yes, I honestly love that. And I feel for my my journey with going through school and I came with perfectionism being my thing. I came with, from the dance industry, truly believing that if I didn't do and be to a certain standard, that it was, it was not good. That was a completely like unacceptable place to live in. And so I completely resonate with everything we're speaking about in regards to even a game console, but with my journey on the school, it was definitely unpicking that and actually rerouting myself in love and rerouting myself in the truth. Um, 
and realizing the standards that one I was holding myself to were completely unrealistic and actually pushing into what God had for me, listening to his words and actually just the words of love and the words of a father and, ah. So good. So good. So good. And what I love about this school is that, um, because sometimes you hear about different schools and you hear, oh, this school does this or this school does that. What I love at our school is the mixture. So there is a very intense beginning. And if you speak to any of our students right now who have just completed their first months of school, they go, oh, yes, that that was a very intense. Because we want to go in kind of hard and fast and and on, on, um, I was going to say program, undevelop some mm. of those things that we have believed in and lived out in life and, yeah. and just get a big refreshing in our heart with God with that. And then start to launch out, to launch out yeah. and, you know, can I actually pray for people? You know, this conference is, can I see the impossible? We're yeah. saying, yes, you, you can see the impossible. And so we're stretching the students out there to, to go way beyond themselves to see, can I see people healed? Can I see people saved? Yeah. Could I preach a sermon? Could I give a prophetic word? Things that yes. normally we'd just be like, oh my goodness. That's that, you know, person on the stage that does that, but it couldn't possibly be me. Exactly. And I, I, you know, I look at all you guys have graduated and just see what you're doing and that you are reaching for the impossible yeah. in everyday life all the time. And part of that is just the adventure. So the yes. adventure of being on school, the adventure of seeing God move. You know, when one person gets saved, when you leave one person to Jesus, mm-hmm. It, 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 it affects you for years, actually, just the impact True. and that God would use you for something like that. Yeah, honestly. And you mentioned adventure there and adventure is definitely a brilliant word to describe mm-hmm. the school. There are so many aspects to the school and depending on who you speak to, you're going to hear every puzzle piece that puts it together. You know, some people come who are passionate to be pastors and some people come who have actually just met Jesus and some people come who are adventurous souls who are like, I want to be on the mission field and I and I want to be sent and I'm going to start here. And so you just reminded me of, of one of my mission trips. So at the end of this of our five month school, we send our students somewhere in the world to basically put into practice everything that they've been learning over those four months. And I got sent on one of my trips to Japan and I was so so changed by that because I went anticipating just pouring out and and seeing miracles and of course we absolutely did but what happened within me was almost more remarkable for my own personal journey and it was something so humbling about seeing the spiritual side of what God was doing of seeing the healings watching people come to Christ watching people hear the word of Jesus for the first time but then also just culturally sitting with these beautiful Japanese children who had never seen a red head, yeah. blue eyes, yeah. lady, girl, and come, and they were touching my face and playing with my hair. Yeah. And I honestly, I feel like I cried my way through my whole school in the most beautiful way with so much revelation. But even in those moments, I feel like God's touch was on all of it because you come away so tra- changed from those trips. So You do. Those outreaches are amazing. And they are they stretching? Yes, they are stretching. Do they open your eyes to the world and what is possible? Absolutely. Do you need to rely on God? Absolutely. And I think um, what what better way to leap into your 20s than than with the school ministry? Exactly. Exactly. So a question we got yesterday was, do I qualify? Like, what, what do I have to have achieved before coming? You know, those kind of questions. Yeah. What do you think of that? Yeah. Well, I think it's a great question because we do get a lot. Some people actually go back into that performance of like, am I good enough? Can I, you know, would I really qualify for the school ministry? And yes. Now, I would say if you are wildly out there, you know, doing doing lots of things that you know you shouldn't be doing, then you should call us and have a chat with us about it. And mm-hmm. we're going to nudge you in the right directions, as I'm sure, you know, your youth pastors and your friends and your parents maybe are nudging you. But come to the school of ministry so how do you qualify you qualify because you are hungry for god you're qualified because you want something more you're qualified because you've seen something more maybe maybe it's very far away but something in you is stirring to know 
I want more of God and I actually want to put five months to the side and just focus on God. I want to come. I want to be mm-hmm. with like-minded people who yeah. are going for God. Again, everyone in different stages, but but we can all, you know, tuck somebody under wing and say, hey, let's go, or somebody yeah. tucks you under wing. So at the school, you have great support because every student is in a small group, and we really mean a small group in order to be known, in order to have somebody who's ahead of you, so you have your own small group leader yeah. who is meeting with you weekly and and saying hey let's go on this journey together so do you qualify yes 99 percent of you do qualify and if you don't yet qualify we're going to walk a journey with you to say hey this is what we're this is what we're looking for so exactly you know regardless come and talk to us come and talk to us exactly so i guess that that's where we should go how can they contact us so firstly how can they get their hands on this switch We are giving out this switch tomorrow at the evening session. So I believe at like seven o'clock, we're gonna be on the main stage. Um, Not only do we have this Nintendo Switch giveaway, but if you go onto our social media, so SOM Toronto on Instagram, we have a giveaway. So if you've loved hearing about the school, um, if you're excited, We are giving away $300, Kathy, $300 off of the school, off of your tuition. So come and pop your name in the raffle. It's in the booth, which is in the back of the auditorium. We can also direct you to our social media there, or you can quickly grab your phone and then put it straight back away, (laughs) SOM Toronto on Instagram, or you can head over to our website for just general more information. So our website is somtoronto.com. You'll find all the information. information. But the best thing is to do, just come and find us. Come and chat to us here. We have our bunk beds in the foyer. You can get a picture and a Polaroid there. So you have something to take home. We have bookmarks we're giving out. um, And we have our SOM lounge, which if you haven't found it, you cross the car park. And it's that big building over there. Um, There are games going on and just loads of people to hang out with. So we love people. We love community. And we want to get to know you. We do. And if you find a school ministry student, ask them. Is it true what they're saying? Is it really real? Is it really real? And I'm pretty sure they're going to say it's amazing. <laughs> so we look forward to meeting you. Yeah. And have an amazing night. And have a, an amazing night.
things get complicated. What do I believe? Where do I place my hope? What's real? What's true? What's true? What actually matters? I feel all alone. I feel afraid. I feel confused. What do I choose? But through the chaos and confusion, there is a way. There is hope. But our hope is vain without faith. Our faith in Him. We walk by faith. There is hope. In Him. We can do all things through Him. We boldly run the race. To see Him change reality. See Him stretch reality. See like He sees. See the impossible. Hello, Fresh Wind, are you ready? Oh, I, I, think, I think they can do better than that. I said, Fresh Wind, are you ready? I want you to turn to the person on your left and say, let's do this. Turn to the person on your right and said, are you ready? All right, before we get started, we're gonna, we're gonna welcome God into this place. He's already here, but we wanna welcome him, right? Right? All right. Yeah, so why don't we just take a moment and everybody just cl close your eyes. Close your eyes, quiet your minds, and let's turn our eyes to Jesus. As we've been praying for this conference, I just see time and time again, you know, the throne of God just coming over this place. How we read in the vision of Ezekiel, you know, how the throne of God comes in riding on angels and he's seated high above. And I feel like there's a visitation that's gonna happen here tonight. There's a line in the sand that's gonna be drawn for so many of us. Tonight is Good Friday. Well, today is Good Friday. We're on the eve of Good Friday. Thousands of years ago, Jesus hung on the cross for us so that we could be here today. He drew that line in the sand over your life thousands of years ago. And he said, no more for whatever you have going on in your, in your life, whether it be, you know, trouble with friends, trouble with family, trouble with your own health, no more. So as we turn our gaze to him now, just start lifting up your voice, start worshiping him and saying, Jesus, Jesus, thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for that line that you drew in the sand thousands of years ago that marked the no more point in my life. Mark the no more point the no more point in my life. So Jesus, we look to you, we honor you, we give you all praise, all glory, all honor be yours now, forever and ever. Come on guys, start raising your voice. Jesus, Jesus, you're holy. Jesus, you're worthy. Jesus, you're good. Jesus, I love you. Start thanking him for the things that he's done in your life. Even if it's the fact that saying, Jesus, I just thank you that you're here, that I'm here. Thank you for this incredible opportunity just to be able to come together and worship. As we step into worship, I just encourage you guys, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. It's just about him and you tonight, just about him and you focus and ask him, hey, Jesus, what do you want to do in my life tonight? Let's worship together.
to the one who made the morning bright He used to the one who taught the stars to shine He used to the one who graced the dead of night Pulled me from the dark, set my heart alight To see, open up my eyes, washed away my sin. He is to the one who gave his life for mine. Broke all my chains and set me free. All right, to the way, oh, oh, to the truth, oh, oh, to the life I live in the light you gave. Jesus is to your name over everything. Oh! 
everything. All, all of this for your glory. Hey! Oh, all my life, all of this for your glory. Every breath I take, Jesus.
turning back Oh, the cross before me And the world behind me No turning back No turning back Oh, the cross before me Just tell me The world behind me no turning back now No turning back oh. The cross before me The world behind me No turning back No turning back No longer Jesus lives in me For I was dead in sin But I woke up to see the light hey, yeah.
you are way maker, miracle work, promise, light in the darkness. Keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. It's who you are. thank you in this moment, Lord, for your sacrifice. Oh, we even just wait here in a moment of just, just resting in his presence, but even just quieting our hearts and just remembering his sacrifice tonight. Jesus, we adore you. Lord, we thank you for your precious body broken your blood poured out. Oh, we just honor you tonight. We just honor the name of Jesus, Yeshua, in this place tonight. Just even all across the room, can we just lift our hands together as just a sign of just honoring him. Just give him a sign of just honoring him tonight, honoring what he's done, who he is.
Lord, it's your mercy over our lives that we are here. And Jesus, we just remember tonight just the act of the cross tonight. I know this isn't like time for the sermon, but I just feel like there's even people in this room that just need to give their life to Jesus even right now. And I just want you to, to respond to him in this holy moment. He's here. He drew you here. He led you here. And just in reverence of Jesus and what he paid for, let's just respond to his love tonight. Jesus, we don't take anything for granted. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy, the better word that you've spoken over each one of us in this room. And we just honor you, we honor your presence, we honor your sacrifice tonight. We say that we love you, we worship you with our whole heart, Jesus. Now come. Come, Jesus. Come fill us tonight. Come fill us as we make room, we make space for you. Come fill us.
mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through, then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace that the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross and the cross has spoken i am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Oh Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hey, hallelujah! Oh hallelujah! Praise the one who said.
broken every chain Broken every chain It is finished, it is done stars my healing all oh, praise yeah. king jesus glory to god in heaven your blood it's still speaking your love it's still reaching all oh, praise king jesus glory to god forever your cross come on your stars my healing all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus. Glory to God in heaven, your blood is still speaking, your love still reaching for praise, King Jesus, glory to God Your blood, it's still speaking in your love. 
love is still reaching. Oh, praise King Jesus. Glory to God forever. Yes, Jesus. King Jesus, we give you all the praise, God. We give you all the praise. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. We worship you in this place, God. You deserve all of our praise, all of the adoration, all of the praise, God. We give it all to you, Lord. We give it all to you, God. We love you, Jesus. Yes, we love you, Jesus. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. Yeah, as we were worshiping, and as Kendrin was saying, you know, I really feel like, like, who are we to deserve God's love? Who are we? What did we do, right? Like, he died on the cross for our sins, right? And even today, maybe some of us are still putting him on the back burner. We're not putting him in first place. We're not spending time with him. We're not treating him like our best friend, but he still died for us. You guys know that no matter how far you go from God, God's gonna chase you. Do you guys know that? He'll chase you to the ends of the earth. God loves you so much. Even if you don't love yourself the same, God loves you so much, he's willing to go the extra mile, right? And still, sometimes we feel like, you know what? I'm gonna do this my way. I wanna do life my own way. I can do it, I can handle it. It's like we're walking in a, a mine tunnel with all the lights off and we're taking a step at a time, but we're like, oh, when am I gonna trip? When am I gonna fall? What am I gonna do next? Where's my next step? But Jesus is right there and he's like, bro, turn the light on. I'm right here, I'm here for you. I love you, I need you, I want you. I wanna be your best friend. Are you guys tired of doing life by yourself? Raise your hand if you're tired of doing life by yourself. Yeah? Who wants to do life with God? All right. The crazy thing is, you know, we've been praying for Freshman Conference for months. And this might be weird, but you know, God talks to me in weird ways too. God put a song in my heart and it was a song that I used to listen to like 15 years ago. And it's by a guy named Kirk Franklin. And it's called, Do You Want a Revolution? Do you guys know what revolution is? All right, let me, let me read it out to you, like what I heard and what I found online, okay? So it says, revolution is a total or radical change as a revolution in one circumstance or way of living, all right? When I got that song stuck in my head, I was like, Jesus, why are you putting this in my head? What does that mean, right? And God showed me a picture of a light switch. And then he showed me a room just like this, filled with youth. And it was the last day of the conference. And it's like everyone just pivoted and did a full 360 and they just switched their mindset. And I feel like God wants us to turn that switch on, the switch of faith, the switch of, I choose you, Jesus, the switch of, I wanna recommit my life to you. Are you guys ready to turn that switch on? If you're ready for that, what I want you to do is take your right hand and put it on your heart. Now the prayer you're gonna repeat is dangerous, okay? I don't want you to pray it if you're not gonna believe in it, if you're not gonna go all in. If you're not gonna give Jesus your yes, don't repeat this. But if you're, you ready? I wanna hear you say, I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, repeat after me. Jesus, I want you in my life. I want you to be the first place. I want you to be my best friend. Today, in this moment, I give you my all. I give you my mornings. I give you my nights. I give you every breath I take. Because you gave your breath for me. So today, I give you all of me. I invite you 
I want you to wreck my life. I want you to take control. I want you to walk with me. And I don't want you to ever let me go. Because I love you. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a cheer. Daniel, I think we need to do something. All right. I think we need to go back and sing um, the bridge from that song again, which is basically what we just pray right now. Your cross, my freedom. All right. Your cross, my freedom. And, and maybe find it. Maybe space yourselves a little bit here. Space yourselves a little bit as much as you can. But, but I think we got to get our bodies involved in this, okay? We've got to tell our body, hey, we're under God. You know, this, this just happened. We're under God, and we're going to dance on the devil right now. All right? Let's go, guys. Where are you seeing your cross? Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise. King Jesus, glory to God in heaven. Your blood, your blood, still speak your love. Your love still reach in our praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever. Your cross, my freedom, your strife, King Jesus, we sing your blood, your blood. Still speaking, your love still reaching our praise. King Jesus, glory to God forever. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, our praise. King Jesus, glory to God in heaven. Your blood is still speaking, your love. Still reaching for praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever. Your cross is my freedom, your stripes are my healing. For praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven. Your blood is still speaking, your love is still reaching for praise. King Jesus, who sing our praise, our praise. King Jesus, our praise. King Jesus, our praise. King Jesus, glory to God forever. Our praise. King Jesus, our praise. King Jesus, our praise. Come on, let's keep singing it. Our praise.
I know there's some of you out there. That was your first time praying that prayer. I know for many of you, Utah, that was your first time dancing that prayer. So right now, just taking it down a, a serious notch here, guys. That's a life-changing moment for you. That's a life-changing moment for you. From that, this moment on, your life is never the same. You know, we've heard... You know, we've heard them share, you know, Josh and Becky both, and Cadence as well. Yes, amazing. Your life will never be the same. Your life will, your life will not be easier, it'll probably be harder. But you'll never get to have to do it alone. Because you have the one, the almighty one, living inside of you. Eternally. So if that was your first time praying that prayer, we don't want you to leave and just be sucked out into the atmosphere. We want you to go and tell somebody. So if you came here with a youth group, find your youth leader and say, hey, I prayed that prayer for the first time, or I prayed it again. For me, there was a point in my life when I was 23 years old, and I prayed that prayer seriously where I was like, this is the turnaround point in my life where I'm saying I'm living entirely for Jesus. And if you're saying that similarly, where like this is the turnaround point in my life where I am living my life for Jesus, tell someone, tell your youth leader, tell your friend. If you don't have anyone to talk to, come find myself, come find Dan. We'd love to talk with you. All right? Amazing, amazing stuff, guys. Give yourselves a round of applause. Turn to somebody beside you. Give them a high five. Turn to the other person on the other side. Give them a high five. Don't miss and hit the person behind you. And see if you can find your way uh, uh, got you. Daniel, don't leave them hanging. All right, let's see if we can find our seats. Say hi, give some high fives on your way back. Find your way to your seats. Find your way to your seats. There's something I'd like to try, but I'm very nervous about doing it. Are you guys with me? Yeah. All right. Can I get a ha oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Let's go. Let's go. All right. We're going to start with the announcements. You can roll it. Hey guys, Zach here again with a couple of announcements for you. Number one, firstly, I hope you guys are having a blast so far. Speaking of having a blast, we got a couple of additional activities for you tomorrow afternoon, laser tag and bazooka blast. If you were here last year, you know what's up. Number two, school of ministry. If you want a life-changing encounter with God and you're looking to make a difference in your city, this is the place to be. So make sure that you're checking out our school of ministry booth out in the lobby. Stop by, ask some questions, get to know some of the graduates. Guys, I'm a former school and ministry graduate and life-changing encounter is an understatement. Check this out. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone and the new has come. Many of you have thought about Christianity and religion for a long time. Are you committed? Are you committed to Jesus Christ? There is so much power 
when hungry people get together in the same place for five months to truly become who God made them to be. <laughs> but there is a cost. Overcoming rejection. Choosing faith over fear. We have to believe it's still possible. We have to believe it's for you, for me, and it's for now. Jesus said you must be born again. Start with your hearts. Be born from above. You can be changed. The world can be changed. The country can be changed. A person can be changed. You can be changed. How cool is that? Who here in the room is a graduate or currently on the school? Just raise your hand quickly. Shout out. Yes, there's a good number of you guys. Guys, I myself is a, I'm a graduate. Daniel, who is up here right there, he's a graduate as well. We actually were in the same small group on the school and now we're good friends. It is, I'm not kidding you when I say this, it is life changing. Seriously, consider it. I'm not just plugging it because, you know, it's happening here. I'm, I'm saying, like, seriously, you, you probably hear how many times it's good all the time. You can't comprehend how good it is. If it wasn't for the school of ministry, I would likely be in jail right now. If you want to hear that story, come find me. But I'm serious, guys. Check out the school of ministry. If you have any questions, see them out in the booth. Um, it is worth every, every dime that you spend on it. Um, quick announcement before I invite up Becky, who is our speaker this evening. Um, if you are a youth pastor in the room, we have one very small request from you. Could you just meet Daniel just by the staircase? And he just wants to have like a 30 second chat with you. Um, so if you're a youth pastor in the room, wave frantically. I don't see any waving. Come on. Yes, one, two, three, four. All right. I don't see you standing up yet, though. So now that you've outed yourself, head towards the staircase over there. And Daniel just has a quick 30-second thing for you, if you don't mind. All right. Guys, why don't you put your hands together for Becky? How good was that yesterday? I do have one bone to pick though, because I'm probably somebody who has YMD or did have it. Um, so I relate spiritually with your husband. I think he's an amazing man, you know? I think there's something to be said about running in front of a storm though. Elijah did it, right? You know? So, guys. Becky had an incredible message last night. If you weren't here and you missed it, I encourage you guys, check it out. It's going to be up on YouTube once the conference ends. By the way, for all of you that are sitting here in the room, you lucky people, we're going to send you out a uh, link to get the whole conference recordings for free. So look out for that in your inbox immediately following the conference. Well, immediately give like the team like three days to sleep or something like that. And then we'll get it to you, all right? Put it together for Becky, guys. Fantastic. Good evening, how are you guys? I like Canada. I like Tim Hortons. I like Fresh Wind having a good time. So good. So all the youth pastors are gone or they're coming back now? They're coming back. Is that them? Are they the youth pastors-ish? Youth pastors in the room here? I love, I had so much fun last night and today has been incredible. This is like a really amazing conference. How many of you, it's your first fresh wind? Can you wave at me? First time. Wow. You coming back next year? How many of you, it's second, third, like you've been coming, you're, you're OG, oh, so good. I love it. Well, we're gonna have some fun tonight. Um, man, 
I just so, I'm just so honored being here. I fly out early tomorrow. I get to be at the airport at 4.30 in the morning, flying back to my family to celebrate Easter. But um, you guys ready for more? How many of you know God has more for you? If you feel, I know, right? That's amazing. What I love about God is he has more for me. He has more for the pastors. He has more for senior leaders. He has more. He has infinitely more for you. If you have been encountered, if he has touched your life, if you have experienced his presence and felt his power through the worship and the teachings, I just want to encourage you. There's more. There is more for you here at conference. And so let's pray as we dive into the word tonight. Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in these students' lives. Thanks, thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for the revival that you are stirring in and through us, God. Thank you for the lives that are being impacted. Thank you for the truth that sets us free. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that enables us to live to our highest calling in you. I pray that you would take us deeper and reveal to us the more that you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amazing. So my youth pastors, are they back? I have, I have a story for youth pastors. I didn't know they were going to leave. Are they back yet? Not yet. Okay. I'll tell it later. Um, I'm just encouraged. Oh, they're back. Oh, this is great. All right, youth pastors, you're going to feel me on this. And, and youth, you're going to, this might help you. I love preaching to young people. I love preaching to you guys. I, so I've said this last night. I love you. I believe in these years of your life. I think teenage years are some of the most important years of your life. We call them the wet cement years because everything is getting set. The decisions you're making, don't buy into the lie that it all starts over when you're 18 or 21. It doesn't. You are bringing with you these decisions into your adulthood. And so these are really important years. And I love preaching to you in these years. I just have one problem. And it is your face. Okay. When I became youth pastor, I came into youth ministry kicking and screaming. I had never attended a youth group in my life. I did not think I was going to be a youth pastor. I did not feel called to youth ministry. And my senior leader said, this is what you're called to, Becky. Trust me. It's a testament to being submitted to godly mothers and fathers who can speak into your life. Because 10 years later, here I am. I said, okay. And I started preaching to you guys, your age. And man, it was hard. Three months in, I'm calling other youth pastors. I'm like, is it this hard? They're like, yeah, and it just gets worse. I'm like, oh my gosh, their face. I don't know here, but in California, it's... I'm like preaching my heart out messages I have poured over. Youth pastors, you feel me on this? Preachers, like I have given my everything to this message. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I'm like, you know what? I am tired of this six months into youth pastoring. I call on my leaders. I'm like, we're going on a fast. We're going to have an encounter and prophecy night. And this is going to be the night that Jesus Culture Youth Group starts to see revival. All of you fast. Cleanse yourselves from all unrighteousness. <laughs> we were going Levitical. Like we were going to do this because I was so sick of their face. And I'm like, I'm going to see their face change. We're going to do something crazy. So we, my leaders are like, yes, let's do it. And so we go after it. We get ready. Wednesday night comes. And, and we're just crying out to God as youth leaders. And we've been fasting for this. And we're doing an encounter night. And it's all about the, the presence and power of God. We're prophesying over all the students. And, and right away into it, like, they weren't feeling it. I'm like, oh, this is so embarrassing. Youth pastors, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you're like, this is not going like I thought it would, and you're just embarrassed, but you can't show that you're embarrassed. And you have no idea why a 15 year old's opinion of you has so much hold on your life, but you're just like, I don't care what you think of me, freshman boy, but I really want you to like me. You know, it's just the weirdest thing. So our encounter night's going, and I'm just like, I'm up there and we're going after it. And, and I just kept my eyes closed the whole night, not because I'm being spiritual, but because I couldn't bear to see the face. So we finished the night, and it was one of those nights that I just wanted to quit. I don't know if you guys ever had that night. I just, every Thursday morning, I tried to resign. I was like, Banning, I'm done. Pastor Banning, thank you. It's been a good two months. I'm done. So Thursday morning, I had co a coffee date with a 16-year-old girl who was in my youth group. She was at that night. 
And so we're sitting there at Starbucks, not Tim Hortons. We're at Starbucks and she orders her, you know, venti frappuccino, extra crunchy caramel ribbon, you know, whipped cream. Spends my entire youth budget on her one drink. I'm like, that's fine. Enjoy. And we're sitting there and I was just, youth pastors, are you, are you with me on this? Who's just like, I'm, you, yeah. I'm like, I'm going to ask her what she wants. I'm going to the source. I'm going to figure out why they are not engaged in the messages and the worship and the things we're doing. So I go, Ellie, what do you want? <laughs> She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, out of youth group, what do you want? Help me, help me, help you. <laughs> Having like a Jerry Maguire moment. I'm like, help me. She's slurping her frappuccino. She's like... Last night was awesome. More of that. And I'm like, my mind is broken. I'm like, last night? I said, what do you mean last night was awesome and you want more of that? Your face didn't say last night was awesome. Youth pastors, hear me on this. However many of you are in the room, this is everything I need. This got me through the eight years of youth ministry I did. Ellie looks at me, 16 years old. She goes, oh, my face, our face. She goes, that's just our face. <laughs> and my, everything was validated. That's just their face. That's the name of my youth ministry book. That's just their face. And, I'm, and I have it right, see, like that didn't move their face. They're like, that's funny. That's right, <laughs> it's just your face. So if you could help me for the next 30 minutes and work on that face, <laughs> it's easy to preach to adults. You hear Ash laughing, she's like, that's sympathy. That's empathy. That's something that we get past 25. You're like, oh, I'm gonna laugh, I'm gonna smile, I'm gonna help her out. Let's, teenagers lack that, that's okay. It's still developing. The empathy. Okay. Every youth pastor, you're encouraged. Just remember, Wednesday night, after a fresh win, your first youth group back. I don't know when you do youth group in Canada. Whatever youth night. Remember, it's not your preaching. It's just their face. <laughs> Worship leader, it's not your songs. It's just their face. Transitioner, wasn't your prayer. It's just their face. Daniel and Cadence needed to hear that. All right. Are we ready, screens man, woman? We ready with my, my pictures? Don't put them up yet, but we're ready. Yes, okay. All right. I don't know if you've ever had a disconnect. Like um, if you have ever, you viewed someone a certain way and they had a different view, like they didn't see it. And it's like this disconnect of how you see something, maybe even how you see yourself versus how someone sees you or how you see a friend versus how they see themselves. Girls, we all have that friend that's like, I'm so hideous. And you're like, you're beautiful. I know, I'm not. <laughs> I know you are. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. <laughs> And they just don't see it, right? They're just like gorgeous and they're like, I don't know if they're fishing for compliments or what, but they're just like, you know, you just don't see it. I don't know if guys have an equivalent to that, but I think, I think you get what I mean. Uh, I shared with you last night, I met my husband very young. We were high school sweethearts. I met him, I was 15 years old. He was 17 years old. And now Derek, uh, he grew up a little bougie. You guys say bougie here? He grew up a little bougie. He had a little bit of that money and that he had a cable television. This is before streaming, okay? We just had you had TV, cable TV, you paid for it and you had access to channels that if you didn't have money, you didn't have access to. I grew up on PBS, baby. I was watching Barney, Arthur, Mr. Rogers, Sesame Street. That's all I had. I didn't have that bougie bucks. We did not have cable TV. Arthur. Barney, Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers. That's what I watched. My husband had access to Nickelodeon, the Disney Channel, and, and I don't know what else. Nickelodeon and Disney Channel were, you know, he was watching MTV and VH1. And so there were different cartoons he grew up with. 
watching those channels. I didn't know nothing about Doug or Hey Arnold or anything like that, okay? This was all stuff on Nickelodeon. Maybe if I went to a bougie friend's house, I'd see a couple episodes, but I wasn't familiar with the Nickelodeon cartoons that Derek grew up on because I was watching Elmo and Mr. Rogers. So when Derek and I started dating, he, um, and I explained to you about kind of my personality, I was that way, always been that way, a little nervous about things, really calculated, I don't like to take risks, I like a plan, I'm a logical, type A, organized, on time person. And the people of God said, amen. So <laughs> my husband, opposite, right? He's go with the flow, he's really laid back, and he's not nervous about anything. So uh, quickly into our dating relationship, he realizes it's about me. Well, we're hanging out one time, and he goes, hey, baby. I said, yeah, boo. If you have pet names for each other and you're 15, stop it. It's gross. We don't like it. He goes, you remind me of somebody. Now, girls, this is my boyfriend. I only want to remind my boyfriend of something beautiful and awesome. And I go, what do I remind you of? He goes, you remind me of, of like a cartoon I used to watch. And I'm like, okay, where's this going, you know? Something cute, I'm thinking something adorable, something you love, something endearing. He goes, yeah, 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 you remind me of Philbert. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no! Oh, that was, that's called a, it's all right, spoiler. Wait, hold on, you already saw it, but let me, let me set this up. It's all right, Screen Sky, we'll pray for you after. Filbert. I have never seen Filbert. Filbert is a character from a TV a cartoon called Rocco's Modern Life. Now in Rocco's Modern Life, Rocco is this character. He's really cool and he's popular and he has a lot of fun. Rocco's awesome. And Rocco has a buddy named Filbert who is a nervous turtle. A nervous turtle that wears thick rimmed glasses and this is who my husband says, my boyfriend at the time, you remind me of Filbert. And he goes, and I'm like, he's explaining Filbert to me. And I'm like, whoa, 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 I, this is not cute. I am not about this. He goes, it'll be better. Let me show you. <laughs> Let me show you Filbert. He pulls up a video clip of this character. Okay. Here's Filbert. This is what Filbert sounds like, and this is what Filbert acts like. This is Filbert, and he's always telling Rocco, oh. just makes that sound. Oh. Oh. First video clip that Derek shows me of Filbert is Filbert on a swing, and Rocco's pushing Filbert on the swing, and he goes, I'm nauseous, I'm nauseous, I'm nauseous, I'm nauseous, oh, oh, Rocco. And he says, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, oh, Rocco, I'm nervous, I'm nauseous. And he's sweating all the time. There's like little animated sweat beads off of Filbert. Take it away, I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed. And this is who my husband, he's trying to like overlay it on me as I'm preaching. Filbert's just like, just really drive that wound in. I'm like, you think I'm cute. He's like, no, I think you're Filbert. <laughs> this, we're going to read a story in the Old Testament about a man who had Filbert syndrome. He saw himself a different way than God saw him. There was a disconnect between how he felt and who he thought he was in the way that God saw him. Open your Bibles to Judges chapter six. Now that I've bared my soul to you and told you my two most embarrassing stories, I've got a third one if you can believe it. There was a man named Gideon, and Gideon and God had a, had a Filbert and Becky kind of situation. I did not see myself as Filbert, but Derek did. You're like, Becky, you're just lucky he married you. <laughs> 
Um, all right, let me set this up. Judges chapter 6. We're going to read a couple verses. What's happened is Israel, we talked about Israel last night, God's chosen nation, the children of God, the nation of Israel. They were called to live in covenant with God, but they couldn't keep that covenant, and they kept turning away from God. This is their history. This is the Old Testament story. And in this time of their history, they have forsaken God again. They are serving false gods again. And every time they would turn away from God, they would get oppressed by enemy nations. And then they would cry out to God for help and God would send a deliverer. And this is the, the pattern. And this is what the book of Judges is about. And God would send a deliverer, a judge, to get them free from whatever enemy nation had been oppressing them and then rule them for a bit. Okay, so you, you're tracking with me. That's kind of the little quick Old Testament history here. Where we're reading is the Midianites have come against Israel and they've destroyed their land. They've eaten up all their crops. They've destroyed their land. And it says that they're, they're in like a really pitiful state, Israel is, as the Midianites are oppressing them. And they're living in all these caves and dens and they're hiding from the Midianites who have come and ravished their land. And they begin, while they're hiding in these dwellings and these caves, they're crying out for a deliverer. And God shows up to a man God shows up to a farmer named Gideon, and God says, Gideon, you're going to deliver my people from the hand of the Midianites. Gideon's a farmer. And God shows up and he says, you're going to be the next leader of my people. And first, I need you to go, and not only are you going to defeat the enemy, you are going to tear down the altars of Baal first. Now, we learned last night. This is serious business. When Israel begins to worship false gods, they really go for it. And Baal represents, Baal is a false god and they've set up altars to Baal and they're worshiping Baal. And they're serious about this worship. They're protecting this worship. And all of culture is, is worshiping Baal. And so to come against the false gods in the name of Yahweh, it's risky. It's risky business. You guys tracking with me? Setting established? Say yeah. Okay, so, so Gideon gets a really big call and a very scary task. So let's read Judges chapter 6, verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our father recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. What's happening is an angel of the Lord, which we can theologically say it's Jesus incarnate, shows up to him and says, Gideon, you're going to deliver them. The Lord is with you. And Gideon's like, what? He goes, dude, what are you talking about? We'll talk about this in a minute. Gideon doesn't recognize it's God. He thinks it's just a guy. He goes, where is God? Don't you see what's happened? We are in a bad state. And if the God that we've heard about, who did all these wonderful things, like leading our ancestors out of Egypt, if that God's really with us, then we wouldn't be, be in this situation. So Gideon doesn't feel like God is with him. Verse 14, and the Lord turned to him and said, this is weird, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. We'll find out as we go on tonight that Gideon goes on to do it. He goes on to do what God has commissioned him to do in tearing down the altars of Baal and and defeating the enemy, the Midianites, and he goes on to do it, and then he rules Israel in peace. So what God has commissioned him to do and told him he's going to do, he goes on to do it. But he had a process to get there, and he has a disconnect between how he sees himself and, the, and how God sees him and how God addresses him. Here's why this story matters to you tonight. God is recruiting leaders in this hour. 
who look like farmers. The enemy has come and they've encamped against Israel. How many of you know that the enemy is at work in this hour? He, he is at work in your generation. I don't need to preach any content on that for, uh, for us to have an agreement. Yep, we see it, we know it, we feel it, we experience it. But when the enemy approaches, God begins recruiting. When the enemy comes, God also begins working. He begins recruiting leaders. And do you know what God loves to do? He loves to choose the unexpected. He loves to work through the things that would confuse people. He loves to show up to the, to the least expecting, to the least qualified, to the least confident and begin to work his plan. Here's what we see with Gideon. Gideon is a farmer, you guys. I need you to get this. He is not a warrior. He is not trained for battle. There are other men alive in this time that are trained for battle. There are actual warriors alive in Gideon's day. Gideon is a farmer, not a warrior. So pull up that picture of the wine press. Here's where Gideon is. Don't, don't make Philbert, not Philbert. This is what an ancient uh, wine press would have, would have looked like in ancient Israel. So Gideon's down there. Now you would make wine in a wine press. He is doing something that you wouldn't even do <laughs> in the wine press. He's threshing wheat, farmers thresh wheat. He has like a pitchfork and you know, it's just kind of this motion. He's taking all the wheat and he's sifting it out so he can make bread with it. Makes him, and he's taking the grain and he's prepping it for, for baking because he's a farmer, this is what he does. And he's down there in the wine press. What he's, he's so afraid of the Midianites, he's taken all the wheat and he's hidden it in the wine press and he's down there doing his job because he wants to hide the grain from the Midianites. He's so afraid. He's doing something that you shouldn't even be doing in a place you shouldn't even be doing it. We're gonna get into why fear makes you do stupid things. You can take that out. You can, you can take that away. I just wanted you guys to see. He's in a wine press and God shows up to this man and he says, hello, you mighty man of valor. Now get this. Man of valor. We think God's saying, hey, brave boy. Like God's being kind. Hey, you're so awesome, Gideon. And I'm gonna encourage you because I'm about to call you to something. That's not what he's saying. Man of valor actually translates to this, equipped for battle. Man of valor was a term that you would only use to people who were trained for army activity. Man of valor is only for people who have been trained warriors, leaders for battle, to use weapons, to be in army formations. This doesn't make any sense. Are you guys tracking with me? The fact that God would show up to a farmer hiding in a wine press and he basically says, hey, Lieutenant, because God doesn't call you as you are. He calls you as he sees you. And he calls you specifically for the destiny that he has for you. How many of you tonight might have a moment where God shows up this weekend and says, hello, doctor. Hello, teacher. Hello, mother. Hello, father. Hello, preacher, missionary. God's showing up and he's handing out destinies tonight and callings. But you might not see it. You might not feel like it. It might seem so completely crazy <laughs> to get a call from God that doesn't feel like anything you're equipped for. But this is how he works. It is absolutely mind-blowing that God would show up to Gideon and say, hello, you mighty man of valor. He's basically saying, you are trained for this. You are equipped for this. You can do this. I just want to encourage you that you might be hiding tonight from your destiny, but God is on mission to find you. And I believe that's why he brought you here to Fresh Wind 2024. I was hiding when I was your age in Wheatfield, Indiana. The town I grew up in was 800 people. 
about probably what's in this room. Like look around at all the people on these cozy blankets with their squish mellows and your, your cozy sleeping bags. This is about the town that I grew up in. Tiny town, middle of nowhere. Nothing good came from it. Nobody did anything great. And my wine press, if you will, that I was hiding in was teenage depression, anxiety, self-mutilation, unforgiveness towards a father who left me when I was five, bitterness towards all the people who had hurt me, anger at sexual trauma and abuse I had experienced. I hated everybody and everything, including myself. And I built a fortress around myself and I was hiding. And God shows up to me at 17 years old and says, Hello, you mighty woman of God. I want to use your life to preach the gospel. I want you to speak to young people. God just shows up in an encounter and begins to speak to me about what he wants to do in and through my life. I looked at God. I turned to God in my spirit. I'm like, don't you know who I am? I don't like, I don't have a relationship with you. This is my experience in my encounter. I'm like, God, I don't have a relationship with you and I don't like super know you, but I honor you enough to be honest with you. You got the wrong girl. I'm not a woman of God. I'm dark and angry. I'm addicted and depressed. I hate you and everything you stand for because if you were so good, like Gideon said, if God's so good and has done so many mighty deeds, then why am I in this hell? I saw damaged goods. God saw a leader in my generation. Gideon was a fearful farmer. God saw a warrior. You see your shortcomings. He sees your destiny. God says to Gideon, hello, you mighty man of valor. What is he saying to you this weekend? What is he calling you? Where's the disconnect between how you see yourself and what you feel and what he's calling you to and what he's going to empower you to do? God looked 18 years ahead and saw the mother, wife, pastor, preacher, and church leader that I would become. And he began to call me that 18 years ago and said, this is what you're going to do. I'm not equipped for it. I've not been trained for it. It doesn't run in my family. I want you guys to get this because he's going to speak to you this weekend. He's going to speak to you in these years in your life. And if you're too afraid and if you're too hiding down deep in a wine press, you'll run the risk of missing it. Gideon gives all these excuses. I'm, what are you talking about? I'm the weakest. I'm from the smallest clan. Some of you tonight, you're just, you're hiding behind your personality. You're hiding behind your past. You're hiding behind your insecurities. You're hiding behind your trauma. Everything you do is, it's because of my trauma. It's because of how I was treated. It's just my personality. No, it's not just your personality. It's dysfunction and you need healing. It runs in my family. Everybody's anxious in my family. Well, how many of you know if you've received Jesus Christ, which you've had many opportunities to do so far, you're in a new bloodline now. You're in a new family now. You've got new DNA now. You're a new inheritance now. What runs in your family no longer applies when you get grafted into the kingdom of God. We make excuses for this stuff. Here's the beautiful thing. Gideon's hiding didn't disqualify him because God doesn't define you by your hiding. He defines you by your call. He didn't define me by, by everything I had felt I was. He didn't define me by everything I had done. He defined me by what he was calling me to do. But I felt afraid. Gideon didn't feel like the leader of an army in a nation. He felt like Filbert. He felt like a fearful Filbert farmer. <laughs> and here's the thing about fear, you guys. Fear will cause you to hide, and you can never live out your calling if you hide. So we have to go to war with fear. 
We have to go to war with fear. You know what fear does? Fear is a very powerful filter. Fear scientifically distorts reality. I've preached this message before. Preacher trick. We preach these messages all the time. That's why they're so awesome. Just kidding. I, I preached this message before, but I needed I, this couple hours ago in my hotel room. I thought, I need to, I want to confirm this. Like I say fear distorts reality because I see spiritually it does. But I wonder what does science have to say? And I'm a nerd. Oh man, I'm a scholar, academic nerd. I just nerd out on scientific studies. And I love when science proves God right. I love it so much. And it happens all the time. So anyway, in my hotel, I thought, I want to know scientifically, what does fear do? So I get on my iPad and I was just typing in some stuff. So, so this, is, this is new research. This is new and improved content here for you, Fresh Wind. Psychology Today, right, a leading source of psychological studies in, sci in the scientific community, Psychology Today, this is non-Christian, a secular, a completely secular, you know, source says this, it has so much about the, the effects of fear. Fear is a filter, fear distorts reality. We see it happening with Gideon. Like fear has distorted what Gideon is seeing. You're gonna, hold on, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Let me tell you this. Um, it said there's five manipulations of fear that happen. I'm just gonna list these off. Five manipulations that, that psychologists have scientifically proven. This is what fear does to you. Fear keeps us from seeing what is in the present. Fear keeps us from realizing that it is the true source of any problem. I'm reading this, I'm like, scientists say this? Scientists say that fear is the problem and, and God all thousands of years ago is like perfect love casts out fear. Like I'm like, oh my gosh, God, this is awesome. None of you get excited about that, that's all right. That'll be a preaching story I use. And I'd be like, I got so stoked in Canada at Fresh Wind about this study. And they were like. <laughs> fear keeps us from looking directly at it. No, I don't want your sympathy now. Fear keeps us, fear keeps us from looking directly at it to see it for what it is. Man, who's the father of fear? He knows what he's doing. I'm gonna keep you from looking at me because I don't want you to realize I'm the source of every problem. Fear keeps us from facing and moving through it when necessary and fear keeps us from looking at or facing the correct fear. And it was just study after study and source after source about how fear is pretty, pretty much it said, fear destroys lives and fear distorts reality. This is why you have to go to war with fear. This shows up for me very personally. I talked about my phobia of birds. I don't, I promise I'm not a phobic person, but I do have very two real phobias, rats and birds, which makes sense because birds are the rats of the air. <laughs> birds freak me out. I'm not kidding you guys, I don't know like, I'm not like Batman, like birds didn't attack me at some young age when I was in a well and I didn't come out like, I am bird woman, you know, like, I didn't have that. Birds didn't like kill my dad, like, but birds freak me out. They're disgusting, they carry disease, they're just like weird beady eyes and their movements and just like, I think every time one sees me, it's gonna peck my eye, like it's coming for me. When they make eye, can't, eye contact, you know that they wanna come and just peck your skin off and your eyes out and I get freaked. And I'm not talking quirky, like, oh my gosh, aren't I so endearing? I'm like so afraid of birds. I'm legitimately afraid of birds. If birds are in a parking lot outside my car, I can't get out of the car. When birds come, if you're eating outside and the birds come at a restaurant, we're out of there. And my friend knew this about me, but she kind of thought I was being exaggerative and just a drama queen. So my friend Sarah and I are at a restaurant called Logan's Roadhouse. It's like a steakhouse and it has really high open ceilings, kind of like this. Now, she had never seen me and a bird interact, but she knows I'm really afraid of birds. As I got to know Sarah, I said, you know, I'm really afraid of birds. She's like, that's weird. Like, you don't like, you just don't like to be around them. I'm like, no, I'm afraid of them, Sarah. I don't ever want to be around one. 
So Sarah and I are at Logan's Roadhouse. We order drinks. You know, she brings out our sodas and brings out some rolls and we order food. And we're just talking, having fun. And she's like a newer friend. I'm getting to know her. And all of a sudden, there's some commotion in the restaurant and everybody's looking up. I'm like, what's going on? And it's not scared commotion. People are like, oh my gosh, look. Wow, what's it doing? Oh, it's so cute. And I'm like, what, is it like a baby up there? <laughs> and we look up and a pigeon has gone into the restaurant and it's flying through the rafters. Not a big deal if you're a normal human being. I am a messed up human being. So the bird is in there and the workers are not doing anything about this. They're just like, oh yeah, it happens. And I'm like, what do you mean it happens? You know, like, what, what are we doing? Call the, the bird police, <laughs> call animal control. There's, there's a rabid rat with wings in the restaurant that we're about to eat. And my anxiety begins to rise as I realize I'm in a closed building with a bird. And I'm getting uncomfortable. And it's like slow motion. Sarah's looking at me. She goes, she's trying to talk to me. I don't hear her anymore. I just like, blah, 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 blah. it's like, I just see her lips moving. I get like this fog. I'm starting to sweat, I feel a little lightheaded. And the bird starts to swoop down, like near where we are. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Sarah, we got to go. She goes, stop it. You're, you know, she's getting kind of embarrassed. She goes, hey, can you, are you okay? I'm like, Sarah, I'm not okay. Listen, I'm, I'm crawling in the back of the, into the corner of our booth. She's like, Becky, are you okay? I'm like, Sarah, I'm not okay. We have to go. She goes, Becky, it's just a bird. And fear, fight or flight, just takes over. I get under the table. I'm a 24-year-old woman under a table. And I'm like, Sarah, we got to go. She's like, Becky, this is embarrassing. We ordered our food. We have to pay. We can't, like, di dine and ditch. I'm like, I'm suing Logan's Roadhouse. We got to get out of here, Sarah. And so I'm like, I'm so sorry. I can't take this anymore. And I just bolt out of the restaurant. I get in the car. She comes out. She gets in the car. And it was one of those awkward drives home where she doesn't say anything. She's just like, that was weird. I'm like... I told you I was afraid of birds. I told you I was afraid of birds. <laughs> I don't see birds. <laughs> I see bears. Like I legitimately see a, a threat that pushes me into fight or flight. When my kids see birds, they run towards them. It's been the most unnerving thing about having children when we go to the park and there's these diseased flocks of geese just out in the wild and my two-year-old's like mom look a bird let's take one home and all of a sudden everything starts to kick in in my body and I'm like oh my gosh we got to get out of here my kids run towards birds I run away from birds because the fear distorts what they are, right? This seems like a ridiculous story outside of the context. That's what fear does. It causes you to do ridiculous things. It distorts reality. The difference maker between you running towards your calling or away from your calling is fear. Gideon is terrified. He's not even, he doesn't even see God, living in submission to fear will blind you to encounters. Because in other translations, this translation, Gideon says Lord, but it's a, it's a lowercase l. When Gideon t addresses the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord has shown up. Now, I don't know what he looks like, but I'm assuming not normal. The angel of the Lord shows up to Gideon. And also, I'm like, he just materializes out of nowhere. And Gideon is so afraid, he's threshing his wheat, being a farmer, in a wine press, scared of the Midianites all around. He says, sir, that's actually what he calls him. He calls him, sir. Gideon doesn't recognize that God has just appeared to him. When you are living submitted to fear, you run the risk of missing an encounter with God and your call. He says, sir, I'm so sorry. I don't know, you know, and he begins to address them like, I don't, know what you're, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not a mighty man of valor. I don't see what you're talking about. God's not with us. Look at, look at everything that's going around us. How many of us, when God shows up and begins to speak to us, this is what I'm talking about. I'm going so hard on this point because if you don't uproot the fear in your life, you'll run away 
from the calling to stand for holiness in an unrighteous generation. You'll run away from the calling to tear down idol worship in your day. You'll run away from the calling to delete that contact that I was talking about last night. I had a girl come up to me. She goes, it's me. I'm texting with a boy. He's leading me astray. We're talking about horrible things. You got to run away from that relationship, but you won't if you're submitted to fear. So how do we deal with it? What do we do? Here's where science comes in again. You know, the only way to effectively deal with fear and people have been trying different methods for years. Fear has been plaguing humans for years. Do you know the only scientifically proven way to overcome fear? Face it. Bring out the birds. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you have to deal with it. You have to step out. You have to face the fear of living differently by living differently. You have to face the fear of embracing your identity in Christ by embracing your identity in Christ. It's so simple, it sounds stupid, but what happens is many of us are just, instead of facing it, we wanna act like nothing's happening. Just threshing wheat in a wine press. And I'm like, God's showing up saying, hello leader. Hello, leader in your generation. Hello, mouthpiece of mine. Hello, vessel for revival. Hello, light in the darkness. Hello, salt and light. And you're like, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo. I don't know what you're talking about. Your friends are out there dying on the battlefield and you're watching TikTok eating Takis hoping someone else evangelizes to them. Stop acting like there's not a war to be won, like there's not battle raging in culture. You're threshing wheat when you're supposed to rise up in battle. You're threshing wheat looking for the leaders. Who's going to show up and save my friends? Gosh, it's getting dark in here. Who's going to tell them that gender's not fluid? I hope someone stands up and speaks truth. God says, I choose you. I don't feel very brave. I don't feel very called. It's not really my personality to get all excited for Jesus. Really? Have you watched yourself at a professional sporting event? Have you heard, your, have you heard yourself evangelize to your friends about your favorite makeup brand? Have you heard yourself talk about your favorite shoes? What do you mean you're not an evangelist? It's all you guys do. You evangelize. It's called influencing. Someone gets it. Do you know why God's looking for leaders? Because Baal needs to be torn down. This is what he calls Gideon to. Before Gideon can become the leader of his people and really fulfill the call in his life, you all have a call of God on your life. He has to tear down the idols. He has to tear down the altar of Baal. Baal is all over the Bible because we still deal with Baal today. It's idol worship. We talked a little bit about it last night. He talked a little bit about it this morning. You know what it is, right? What's an idol? Anything that takes your attention and affection. And I'll say this again, because you got to get this. You don't have to lift your hands to it to worship it. It's the things that are stealing your attention and your affection that are the idols of our day. So many of you, you know more about the timeline of Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey's relationship than you do about the timeline of your salvation history. You can tell me the details of the Kardashian family line, but you can't tell me the sons of Abraham. You know more about what's trending on TikTok than you do verses in the Bible. And you want to show up here and say, we don't have idol worship. Are you offended? Are you tired? Ooh, got the California heat on me tonight. Oh, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated at the lies that we've succumbed to. I've got three kids coming up in this culture. I am passionate about this. 
I lived my entire teenage years bowing down to the altars of Baal because nobody was brave enough to call me on it and point me to the direction of Jesus. I was asked to take a couple in our youth group to chaperone them to a secular concert. They were dating. They were really influential, really cool, cute couple, dressed good, good looking, everybody admired them. So as youth pastor, we call them our Paul Revere's. They're our influencers and, and what they do is kind of like whatever they do, everybody will follow and you really want to get them on board. So I was always challenging them like, hey guys, show up, you're leaders, you're called to influence, like show up and engage in worship and engage in the word. And I just believed in them and they would say this, they're, they loved God, they, they, weren't, they weren't horrible, you know, they were, they were like, but it's not our personality, like we're just not like, and we have this conversation where they go, hey, we feel kind of judged by you. Teenagers have some audacity, don't they today? I would never, but y'all do, and it's cool. We feel kind of judged by you. Like, don't judge us. It's just not our personality. We don't have to lift our hands and worship. We're worshiping in our hearts. And I was like, and actually, I, I, I kind of felt convicted. I'm like, man, maybe I am being too harsh on you guys. And I guess, yeah, it's not everybody's personality to kind of be up front worshiping. But I kind of wrestled with it. But I'm like... Man, the Bible says, lift your hands, and it's not an option, it's, it's a command, and we kind of had this wrestle, you know? They're like, it's not my personality, like, and don't judge us. You don't know what we're doing in our hearts, like, we're worshiping. You don't have to, we don't have to be, like, all expressive up front. It's not our personality, Pastor Becky. So then I was asked to chaperone them to this secular concert. I said, Okay. So we go, you know where I'm going with this. So we go to the concert and we're up in the nosebleeds, 10,000 in the venue. <laughs> 10,000 people, we have a hard time getting 50 to youth group. That's all right. But yeah, Bale. Bale's not around today. So we get there, they're stoked out of their minds. And I'm watching this, I'm watching this cute couple who's not their personality to get all crazy in church. And they are a little bit more reserved. We're at a Khalid concert. You remember Khalid? Young, dumb, young, dumb, and broke. Young, dumb, young, dumb, and broke. Can I have a million dollars too? <laughs> anyway, um, so, we get, so we get there. We're up here in the nosebleeds. 10,000 young people in the stadium. And it was a good production. All the lights go dark. The show's getting ready to start. The bass is bumping. And he has this catwalk, and they had this whole setup where you weren't going to see him come out. You were just going to see his shadow first. Just his shadow is going to come out first, kind of the, the allure and the excitement. And I'm watching this couple. It's not their personality to worship. And I felt convicted because they felt judged by me when I challenged them to express their love for Jesus. Khalid's shadow, not his actual body, his shadow hits their line of sight. And the two, the two teenagers, it's not their personality to get crazy in worship. I watch them. I watch them go, oh my gosh, Khalid! And the boy's like, oh. And I was like, whoa, you worship something. And then I couldn't even, I couldn't even enjoy the night because I watched 10,000 young people lift their hands to a man who did not hang on a cross and die for them. Lift their hands in worship to a man who could offer them nothing. It grieved me. It grieves me that we have bought into the lie that our attention and affection goes to other things. We have to tear down the idols in our day that's who God's looking for. 
those who would stand against Baal. He calls Gideon to do this. You guys doing all right? Just taking a minute. He's looking for leaders. Does he need you? No, he actually doesn't. That's the beautiful thing. He wants to use you. He could actually go and take care of it on his own. He could do it take care of all of it, but he wants to partner with you. He wants to use the gift that he's given you. He wants to move in and through your life and your life and your life and your life to go and reach your generation, to go and bring revival, to ignite his plans and purposes in the earth. Because you're awesome? No, you're actually not awesome. But it says the spirit of God clothed Gideon and that's what enabled him to go and do the thing that he was called to do. And tonight, the Spirit of God is going to clothe you. The Spirit of God is going to clothe you. It's scary to go and contend with culture. It's scary to go and stand for righteousness and holiness. It's scary to go and confront sin. Guys, you have to confront it. Don't celebrate it. You have to repent from it. Don't tolerate it. You have to turn from it and not to it. This is how you tear down Baal. This is how you begin to remove those high places and the idols in your day. But he's with you. Like you're not on your own. This is his whole encounter with Gideon. He's like, Gideon's like, I'm nobody. You're right. You aren't. You aren't anybody. You are not awesome. You in your own right can't do it. And Josh talked about this this morning. But it's through the Holy Spirit and through the Spirit of God clothing Gideon and the Spirit of God clothing you and the Spirit of God clothing me that you can go and contend you can go and confront those places and confront those things. This is what he's calling you to do. This is what we're calling you to do. This is what we want to commission you into tonight. He's visiting you. He's reminding you of who you are. He's calling you something that you don't feel equipped for, that you don't feel like, that you don't feel, you don't see. And he's saying, this is what I want you to do and I will go with you. So Gideon gets through all his fear and doubt he gets through all the mental hurdles. He does this funny thing where he's testing God. Are you real? Are you not? It's a really cool story. And then what does he go do? He has to go before he can con confront the Midianites, before he can actually step into the leadership and begin to lead his people. He has to tear down this altar. They set up an altar to Baal. Uh, the worship team can come on, come on up. They set up the altar to Baal. And do you know who's guarding it? Get this. The Bible's so awesome. You know who's guarding that altar? You know who's protecting it? Gideon's dad. Let me tell you this young person, because this is real. This is real life. You are gonna have to leave this conference and go and contend with things. You are, you are going to have to confront your father issues. You're gonna have to go deal with that. You've got father issues in the house tonight, mother issues. You're going to have to go deal with those things that are so familiar. You've wrapped your identity up in them. You're going to have to go deal with the things your parents didn't deal with and get victory that your family didn't get victory on. I had to go and deal with my father issues to step into what God has called me to do. I couldn't live in the bitterness and anger of my father who left me when I was five years old and then would abuse me at every visit. And I had real reason to be angry and real reason to be traumatized and real reason to be broken. But here's the thing, Gideon doesn't become Gideon that we read about. He doesn't become the example by just staying in the wine press. He gets the call of God. You're called to do this mighty man of valor. I'm going with you. You're gonna lead my people. You're gonna tear down, tear down the altars of Baal. Cool. You're gonna have to leave here and step out of the wine press. Get, behind from, get out from behind your phone. Step outside of what you deem is your personality. Get out of some familiar habits and go with the Spirit of God clothing you and live differently.
You're going to have to actively go and tear down altars. You're going to actively have to go and go, like we said last night, living like the remnant would live, which might mean you're confronting father issues. You're confronting family issues. You're confronting familiar things. Do you know what I'm saying? You're not... You're not the calling by staying the same. And this is what the enemy wants you to think. You can do it all with, without getting uncomfortable. You can do it all without really changing any habits. You can do it all without really sacrificing. And sometimes what happens is we get, we get some courage 24 hours after conference, 48 hours after conference, we step out of the wine press and we're like, I'm gonna live differently. I'm reading my Bible every day. You're like, that's kind of boring. You kind of inch back. Here's the wine press. Your friends are like, oh, that was just at conference. We don't like, we're not doing that all the time. You're only gonna listen to worship music? Isn't that kind of legalistic? What do you mean you're not gonna hang out with those people anymore? And we inch back in to what's comfortable we get more, we get afraid again. And we go back, yeah, you're right, okay. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna read my Bible tonight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna scroll Instagram for a minute, just for a sec. Oh yeah, you're right. It's not really a big deal if I compromise a little bit here. I'm just gonna send that one text, I'm just send that one picture, just one more time, just one more scroll. And pretty soon, here we are again, back in the wine press, missing our calling, missing God, war raging out there, and we're just hiding in our fear again. You have to live differently. You have to walk through the, in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Are you guys with me? And then what happens after all of that? Let's go to verse, Judges 6, let me find the verse. They don't have it up, so I want you to, I want you to highlight this. Judges 6, he goes, he confronts dad, he tears down the altar, they're gonna kill him, dad saves him. And then verse 32 says, therefore on that day, they called him Jerob Baal. Gideon gets a new name. I don't know if you know this, but Gideon didn't stay Gideon. He became Jerobel, which means he who contends with Baal. He gets renamed into his destiny. He who confronts idol worship. He who confronts culture. He who contends with what everybody else is doing. He who stands against the idols of his day. Gideon, once he responds to the call, gets the new name. I believe that this is what God is doing in your generation. I think he's renaming you. I was Becky who hung out with druggies. I was Becky whose dad left her so she was busted up and, and easy. I was Becky who cut herself to feel something. I was Becky who had an eating disorder. I was Becky who got into fights in the hallway if you looked at her wrong. I was Becky who was down to party Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. I was Becky who had the hookup. I was Becky who was broken. I don't know what you've been known for. I don't know what people call you. I don't know what identity you've wrapped around yourself. But God desires to rename you. He has a he has a crazy habit of giving people new identities. Abram becoming Abraham, Sarai becoming Sarah, Jacob becoming Israel. Becky, from Wheatfield, Indiana, who had no plans for her life, became Becky, Christian, married for 15 years with three beautiful children who loves the Lord and his church. I hope that applause wasn't for me, 
because it's what God did in and through me. And I will give my life saying things that nobody else wants to say if I could get through to one 17 year old girl who gets convinced of God's love for her and goes out of here to live differently. We have to contend with culture and not live for it and worship it and succumb to it. You've got to meet with God and hear what he has for you and then get out of the wine press of fear and begin to live differently. You have to answer the call of God to leave something behind and step into your fullness so that you can receive the new name that he has for you. If that's you tonight, I wanna invite you forward so we can pray. Now hear me on this. We like to respond to anything at conference that says rush forward. Here, wait, stop, stop. Because it's all the same kids that come to the front and I love that. But the Bible makes it clear that anybody who doesn't count the cost of following Jesus is a fool. Because at some point this is gonna get really difficult and it's gonna get really real. And I don't wanna know that I lived my life speaking at conferences where we responded in emotion, but it didn't lead to true revival. So I'm calling, and I don't care if it's one of you, I'm calling the ones who truly want to contend, the ones who truly want to tear down the idols, the ones who truly want to leave well, the altar that you're worshiping at and come to the altar of the one true God. I want to call the ones who maybe haven't responded to anything because you know it would be too difficult because you're afraid of what that would require of you. I want to call the ones that have been sleepy and disengaged in the back and haven't made their way up front. I want to call those ones that truly are going to count the cost. That's who I want to come forward. because we're gonna pray real prayers. We're gonna leave real things here tonight. We're gonna come out of here really changed, if that's you. But just count the cost, because it, you know, if I'm honest, if we're honest, there's some of you that you're like, I don't really have any plans to change. That's okay. Maybe it's not for you tonight. I love if, it, I love if that changed. I'm just asking you to be honest. I think we've had too many charismatic conferences, right, Josh, where we call people forward. And then you know what happens? You guys come, you respond out of emotion, and then you leave and you go back to bail, and then the world goes, Christianity is hypocrisy because they claim Jesus on Wednesday, but they smoke a blood on Friday. You're wearing Jesus loves you merchandise, but you live like you don't love him. Don't take the name of Christ in vain, but come forward if you want true freedom. Come forward if you want to really live differently. Come forward if you want to get radical. Come forward if you really want to contend. Come forward if you're really ready to leave your pornography addiction. Come forward if you're really ready to delete that contact. Come forward if you're really ready to have a new reputation. Come forward if you're really ready to stop listening to trashy secular music that poisons your mind and distorts how you view the opposite sex. Come forward if you're really ready to step out of that homosexual relationship. Come forward if you're really ready for a baptism of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit of God is gonna begin to clothe you, young people. The Spirit of God is gonna begin to clothe you and empower you to go out and contend. It won't be easy. Gideon's father is guarding this thing. His father, can you imagine? You know what Gideon said? He had to show up and say, Dad, this ends with me. I had to say, Family, divorce ends with me. Addiction ends with me. Depression ends with me. Close your eyes. Peers, don't pray for each other right now. I want you to begin to ask God to clothe you. Say, Spirit of God, clothe me. 
Spirit of God, give me the courage to go and contend with culture. I want to leave different. I want to live different. Just you and your own words. Come on. If we creep, if we keep praying for you, you're not going to know what to do tomorrow when you go home. You're not going to know what to do Monday before school. I want you to begin to say, God, I need you. Keep your eyes closed. God, I need you. Push us. God, I need you. Here you go. Just like that. She's doing it. You got it. Come on, cry out to him. Come on. You got to awaken that thing inside of you. Come on, you're so used to getting, to being entertained and spoken for. Find your voice, generation. Find your voice. Come on. Find your cry. Find your cry for the Lord. Say, I need you. Spirit of God, clothe me. I want to step away from, and then tell him what it is. I want to step, I'm tearing down this altar tonight. I'm tearing down this addiction tonight. I'm tearing down this stronghold in my life tonight. I'm tearing down fear of man. I'm tearing down fear of man tonight. I'll no longer live in worship of the opinion of others. And you know who it is. You know whose opinion you value above God's. I want you to, 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 to right now, just put it on your lips. I'm walking away. I'm walking away from this altar. I will no longer care you can say these words. I will no longer care what, fill in the blank, fill in the name. I will no longer care what they think about me more than what God says to me. I will no longer care about what they think about me more than what God says to me. Some of you need to say that. We'll say it again. I will no longer care about what their name thinks about me than what God says to me. Who in this room really struggles with the fear of man? Who am I talking to? It's fear of man, which means what people think about me. You know your life would look quite different if you didn't care so much about what people thought about you. You know your life would look radically different if you didn't care about what people thought about you. Who am I talking to? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I want you to lift both your hands. If that's you, lift both your hands. If that's you, you heard me, right? If that's you, lift both your hands. Say, fear, go. Say, fear of man, you have no place. Say, fear of man, I do not serve you. Say, fear of man, go now in the name of Jesus. Just keep pressing in, guys. Fear of man, go. Holy Spirit, come. Fear of man, go. Holy Spirit, come. Blow like a wind. Fear go. Holy Spirit, come. Burn like a fire. That's it. That's it. We're gonna sing that out. Come on. Holy Spirit, come. Burn like a Some fire. of you don't sing out because of the fear like of man. Wind. That's you. Begin to sing out. Holy We're saying Spirit fear go. Come. Holy Burn Spirit like come. Burn like a Blow fire. Like a wind. Blow fear like the wind. Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit come. come. I'm not a singer, like but a I don't fire. care what you think. Blow God like loves my voice. Come on. Step out of that fear, Holy man, right now. Burn like a it doesn't fire. matter what the person Blow next to you is doing. Come on. Get loud. Fear go. Holy Spirit come. Burn like a fire. Blow like the wind. Fear go, oh, God. Holy Spirit God. come. Some of you Burn must break like with fire. fear right now. Like and 
Let's do this. Come on. Fear go. Holy Spirit, come. Burn like a fire. Blow like the wind. Fear go. Holy Spirit, come. to break through, but we are not there yet. There is more freedom. There is more freedom for many of you. I feel like a baptism of the Holy Spirit's about to come. A baptism of the Holy Spirit's gonna come. The shoe is untied. It's a baptism of the Holy Spirit's gonna come and it's gonna set us free. I have more, I have more freedom. I have more fear of man that I need to deal with because it comes, man, it comes on you. When you get more influence, you start to care more about that. And so I do things that look ridiculous because I want to make sure that I let the enemy know I don't care what people think about me. I care about pleasing God. No, don't, don't clap. I want you to press in. I want you to press in. That fear to, to lose your grip. Girls, it is keeping you in relationships you shouldn't be in. It's fear. 
Many of you, your addiction is wrapped up in the fear that you'll never find love. And so you're trying to look for a false version of it because you don't trust that God has a better in mind for you. You don't trust that God has your best in mind. And so out of fear, you're driven to a false form of love, but it's fear. Young men, you wanna know the question that God placed inside of you? You wanna know, do I have what it takes? And when you are afraid that you don't have what it takes, you'll begin to live outside of your identity in Christ. Girls, you wanna know, am I worth it? And when you are afraid that you're not worth it, you will settle for less versions. So we're gonna go after fear. And we're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to come and rattle us. We're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to come and break through. We're gonna ask for a baptism of the Holy Spirit to come and fall on us, however that looks like. Whatever that looks like, we just say, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We will get loud about Jesus. We will express our love. We will live out our calling. We will be a generation known. Oh gosh, Gen Z is known for so many things. You're known for so many negative things. I am giving my life to see Gen Z known for their passionate love for Jesus known for their worship, known for their love for the Word of God. But we have to deal with this. We have to deal with fear. If you can get rid of that thing, you will leave different. You can live different. So we're gonna say, Holy Spirit, come just begin to invite the Holy Spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit, you come however you want to. You just say, we'll wait for you here. Deal with us. Just there's some unfinished business tonight. If you guys, if you're not on the prayer team, if you guys can wait and not pray for each other right now, unless you're a, if there, are, there are certified prayer team people, right? Like school of ministry students. So if I could just ask you guys, cause sometimes it can get in the way, it can distract. And friends, you're well-meaning and you're like, oh, I just wanna pray for her. Not right now, okay? Cause we're dealing with some stuff. Holy Spirit, come. It's not me, it's you contending right now. I don't have anything to offer you. We're just, we're just following the Spirit. Say God, hold, say God, come. Come and deal with this fear in my life. I'm afraid of what my dad thinks about me. I'm so afraid that I'm gonna be like my dad that, that abused me and left me and I've just been living out of this fear. I'm afraid of my mom. I'm afraid of the words that she's spoken over me. I'm afraid of what people might think about me. I'm afraid I'm not gonna make it. I'm afraid I actually couldn't be a missionary because I don't know God if I, if I really see that, but it's the word on my life. I'm afraid, I don't know if I could really have influence and, and be a mouthpiece for you on my campus. God, I don't know if I could start a club, if I could really start a, a Jesus club or, or a prayer meeting, whatever it is. Just begin to bring that fear out of the darkness and into the light, say, I don't want to serve this fear any longer. But Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. Pray for a fresh baptism. If you have your prayer language, just begin to pray out in your prayer language. Make intercession. Holy Spirit, come and deal with fear. Deal with the strongholds. Deal with the root of it. Deal with the lies. Just uproot fear of man. Keep pressing in, guys. Just keep praying out. Holy Spirit, on us. I want to know you more. Holy Spirit, fall afresh on us. I want to know you more. Holy Spirit, fall afresh on us. Holy Spirit, 
up keep pressing in don't grow tired don't grow weary press in press in press in Tim, deal with this tonight say God come and cleanse my heart come and wash over me God wash over me Holy Spirit purify me Holy Spirit set my priorities right begin to ask that he would deliver you, deliver you from fear so that you could step into the fullness that he has for you, that he would deliver you from fear. If you have your prayer language, pray out. Band, let's get into something a little bit.
on you right now fear goes and it's replaced by the awe of God let that rest on you right now the awe of God settling you know as we were singing fear go I just saw Jesus coming and ripping a veil off of this auditorium. That veil of fear that has been over our lives where we see things differently, that's ripped off. Now we can see clearly. Now it's our duty to act like it. In Luke, we read that Jesus sent out the 72 disciples, sent them out in pairs. I think that's what we need to do now. Fear of man is gone. Fear of birds is gone. Fear of whatever else is gone. The fear of God remains. The fear of God is the awe of God. We stand in wonder and amazement and desperation saying, God, nothing but you. And I bless that desperation to settle on each and every one of our hearts right now. That as we go out from this place, changed people, from now on, every person that you see, going back to your hotels, 
going back to your homes, getting into the car. Somebody needs prayer. Somebody needs to be healed. Somebody needs to be influenced. You're the person that's there. It's up to you. I'm speaking this to myself as well, by the way. It's up to us. God has put us in this position, in this place for a reason. Take hold of it. I want to hear stories tomorrow. I fully expect, guys, I am fully expecting right now that there's going to be testimonies tomorrow of somebody going out to the hotel. You happen to get into an elevator with somebody that has a busted up leg, and guess what? It's going to be healed. But you never know. You will never see the impossible unless you attempt the impossible. You will never see the impossible unless you attempt the impossible. So try. It's not like you can do anything anyway. It's not like I can do anything anyway. It's all up to God. I'm going to read quickly from Luke 10 here. So Jesus sent out his 72 disciples, sent them out to go ahead and to go into all the towns and to pray for people and all that. Now they come back. This is what I'm expecting is going to happen tomorrow. They come back. The 72 returned with great joy and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And then Jesus said to them, I watch Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Came down so fast because what you guys are about to do is go disrupt all his plans, wreck all his plans. Listen carefully, I have given you authority that you now possess, Holy Spirit living in us, to tread on serpents and scorpions, the ability to exercise authority over all the power of the enemy, Satan, and nothing will harm you. Nevertheless, this is the key part, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. If you haven't seen the record of your name in, in heaven, I encourage you ask. I did that one time. You know, if every, anyone's in here being like, oh, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'm saved. That was me. I was going through that. I was actually at the school ministry when I was going through that. It's like I've grown up a Christian my whole life. I don't know if I'm saved. You know, what's the proof that I'm saved? And God gave me such a distinct vision where he brought me into heaven. He showed me the book of life and opened it to a page in there and in it was written my name. I couldn't see any other names. They were all blurred out, but I could see my name. If you don't have that, ask God for that. He'll show you. Now I want you to know what's gonna happen in heaven when you guys go out from here. Jesus said, in that very hour he was overjoyed and rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. He said, I praise you all, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, but revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was, this way was well-pleasing in your sight, and all things have been transferred and turned over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone whom the Son wishes to reveal him. So guys, through the Holy Spirit in you, tonight, go out and reveal him. Go out and reveal him. Turn to your friend beside you, or non-friend, introduce yourself and say, go out and reveal him. And all it takes is a smile. Even there, over there, I was, I was feeling a little bit, you know, I was praying while we were in worship, God, what, what do you want to do? What do you want to share with everybody? I was feeling nothing. I was getting so discouraged. 
And Mateus, where are you? Somewhere. He's on the school. He came up to me and he just said, I don't know why, don't ask me why, but God, I just feel like God wants to give you a hug right now. Can I give you a hug? Came and gave me a hug and just prayed a really simple prayer for me. And guys, that's all I needed. So go do that for somebody tonight. Deal? Deal? Nice. All right. Go home or go to your hotel. Get some rest. Actually go to sleep. Sleep. Ask God to show you your name in the book of life. Right? Actually, let's all just pray for our... uh, I want to just pray for all our sleeps right now. So put your hand on your head. Father, I just bless the sleep of everyone in this room tonight, God, that they would just receive receive dreams from you tonight, that you would speak words directly to their heart, and that you would be renewing their mind as they sleep tonight, God, that they would be that they would awaken refreshed, completely mind, body, and spirit, and anyone who has been suffering with uh, migraines or nightmares, that is gone right now in the name of Jesus. And you will have your peaceful sleep tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, we will see you back here. Doors open at 9 a.m. 10 a.m. is session start. So make sure that you're here in time to grab your seats. We'll see you all tomorrow morning. Have a good night.